So today we're going to be talking about waves, which relates back to simple harmonic motion because we have some sort of repeat, repetitive repeating mo motion when it comes to waves. So first we're going to talk about some properties of waves. So first we need to know what a wave is. A wave is a disturbance in a medium the medium is either a solid, liquid, or gas that transfers energy and momentum from one place to another without a transfer of mass. So anytime we have a transfer of energy, anytime we have a wave, we are transferring energy, but we're not actually moving any of the particles. A pulse is a single disturbance moving through a medium, so it's one wave itself. The mediums are a substance or material that carries the wave. It's composed of parts that are capable of interacting with each other. So a medium should have some way that the particles can interact. So in a physical way, that means that the atoms of the medium are bumping against each other, and those bumps create a chain reaction. You can kind of think like a Newton's cradle or a domino effect. One domino knocks into another domino, knocks into another domino, and the wave essentially of those dominoes um, move down the line. And the medium is going to determine the speed of the wave. That's important. It seems right now it seems like a, a kind of a throwaway piece of information, but make sure you have that in your notes. Medium determines the speed of the wave. The closer together the particles are, the faster the wave can move. So some examples of mediums and their waves, water is one, it could be ocean waves, air, sound waves, earth can have seismic waves. Any of those also can carry sound because sound travels through water, it travels through air, it travels through the earth. So this um, blank screen right now, it's not playing, but there's a video of the Tokyo um, wave pool, one of the Tokyo wave pools, and it is, I'll find a, a link to it and put it in the description below. But it's a video of people packed just about as close as they can get in this wave pool. And when the waves start, you notice that the people go up and down and not side to side, right? So the waves are transferring energy and not mass. If they were transferring mass, they would. the people would all get swept onto the shore. But it's not transferring mass, it's transferring energy. If you get hit by a wave on the beach, you feel its kinetic energy, not necessarily its mass. So there are also two types of waves and how they move and how they interact with particles. The first kind is a transverse wave. Transverse is means that the particles that are moving are moving perpendicular to the direction of the wave propagation. So the wave propagation is the way the wave is moving. So again, this little GIF, it would be animated on my slides. If you're one of my students, you can find these slides on the website and you can animate the, um, the GIFs so that you can see them or you can search them on Wikipedia transverse waves, um, but just imagine that these waves were moving, right? So you would see the wave move off 
to the right. The wave itself, each little crest would be moving to the right. The top of the wave would be moving to the right. But the particles would not follow the, the wave. Those little blue dots are just moving up and down on their green lines. So these are transverse waves. The particles are moving perpendicular to the way the wave is moving. The wave is moving to the right and the particle is moving up and down. A longitudinal wave is a wave in which particles of the medium move in a direction that is parallel to the direction that the wave moves. So one example of this is a slinky. If you push the push on a slinky, so you're not moving your arm up, up and down with the slinky, you're just giving it a push, it creates a wave of compressed areas in that slinky that travels in the same direction that you pushed it. And again, this, this gif down here with the several slinkies hooked to several walls, that's from um, physics classroom. You can look up longitudinal wave gifs and see um, uh, examples of what I mean by the wave and the direction of the particles is in the same direction. But again, if you imagine a slinky, the slinky is going to move back and forth in that little area, and the wave will continue all the way down the, sling, the slinky. So some other words that we need to know about longitudinal waves is compressions. That's where the longitudinal wave has a greater density of particles or greater pressure if we're talking about air. So there's more pressure, there's more density in a compressed area. And then rarefactions are where the longitudinal wave is more spread out. So the slinky gets expanded. There's less slinky loops in that area than normal. So this, these are nicely animated. So you can see the particles in the medium and they're illustrated by little red dots. Here on the transverse wave, the red particles are moving only up and down and the wave is moving to the right. Here, the particles on the longitudinal wave, the particles are moving a little bit to the left and right, but they're not moving the entire way. So I'm trying to draw lines on the uh, illustration there. So you can see the particles moving back and forth, but they're not going all the way with the wave. So again, a transverse wave and a longitudinal wave, they are transferring energy but not mass. The particles are staying in the same location relative to each other. And they are not transferring, the, the wave is not transferring their mass. It's only transferring momentum and energy. What kind of waves are transverse waves? So hopefully if you've seen water, Water, to some extent, is transverse wave. What about a longitudinal wave? Longitudinal waves, I think, are a little trickier, but some examples of long longitudinal waves would be sound. Another example of a longitudinal wave would be an earthquake. And of course, the slinky, if we give it a push. Electromagnetic waves are special. They don't need a medium to travel. Right? So that means they can travel in outer space. 
mechanical waves, which is what we've been talking about, cannot travel in outer space. They absolutely must have a medium. So what kind of things cannot travel in space? What kind of waves will not travel in space? What, what examples do we have of that? Sound is one example. We have to have air or some medium in order for sound to travel. And in outer space, we don't get that. So there is no external sound in outer space. But what kind of things can travel in space? So what things can we get from outer space? Light. Light is an electromagnetic wave. Radio. Radio is an electromagnetic wave. That's how we communicate with the astronauts in the International Space Station. Electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light, and mechanical waves travel at any speed slower than the speed of light, and usually it's significantly slower than the speed of light. Electromagnetic waves are only transverse, and mechanical waves can be transverse or longitudinal. So let's get to wavelength and some phrases that we commonly use when we're talking about waves. So wavelength is the length of one cycle of the wave. And since it's a length, it will be measured in meters. And it has a funny symbol. It's got a lower lowercase lambda, Greek letter lambda kind of looks like an upside down line. And this is wavelength is um, no matter what kind of wave we're looking at, whether it's a transverse wave or a longitudinal wave, it's always measured for one cycle. So usually it's easiest to measure from crest to crest or trough to trough. So crest is the top part of the wave the very top. Trough is the very low part of the wave. So one wavelength, we could measure it from crest to crest. And it doesn't matter which crest we have. We can also measure it from trough to trough. This would be the same distance if we used a ruler to measure it. We can also measure it in between from middle to middle, but we have to be very careful about which middles we're going from. So what is one complete cycle for this wave? If we start at this middle and we want to continue on for one wavelength, how far would we have to go? So for one cycle, we would have to go all the way other to this next middle. We have to go down then up, then back down again. Amplitude is how far you are from equilibrium. So from this middle position, which is equilibrium, we have the amplitude, and that's about it. For longitudinal wave, it's easiest to measure from compression to compression. And then we can see the rarefaction. It's also very difficult to measure the amplitude for a longitudinal wave, so we don't usually give you a longitudinal wave and ask you to label the amplitude and measure the amplitude. We could easily do that with a transverse wave, though. The energy of the wave is going to be proportional to the square of the amplitude of the wave. So the energy only relates to the wave's amplitude. So 
So if you think of sound, a strong sound is only going to be measured by how loud the sound is. A strong wave in the ocean is directly related to how high the wave is. It doesn't matter how fast the waves come into the shore, it only matters how large the wave is compared to the equilibrium point. So here we have a low energy wave and a high energy wave. The low energy wave has a low amplitude and the high energy wave has a high amplitude. How close, how closely these are to each other does not affect the wave's energy. It doesn't matter how, what the wavelength is. Wave speed, again, depends on the medium, but speed is distance divided by time. So a wave speed is how far the wave, uh, one point in the wave travels in a certain amount of time. And because it depends only on the medium, it also is going to depend on the temperature of the medium, the density of the medium. It can also depend on the tension of the medium if we're moving through a string. And it is not going to depend on the wave. So it doesn't matter what's happening to the wave. It doesn't matter how much energy the wave has. And it doesn't matter how much amplitude the wave has. So even though the wave speed is only affected by the medium, so it's still only affected by the medium, the way we calculate it depends on the wave itself. So the velocity of the wave is going to be calculated by multiplying the wave's wavelength times the wave's frequency. So remember, wavelength is going to be measured in meters. Wave uh, frequency has a unit of hertz, which is also the same as 1 over seconds. So if we're multiplying the wavelength times the frequency, we wind up getting the correct unit of meters divided by seconds. So wave behavior, now we're going to be talking about how waves behave in the medium, how they interact with each other. So we need to know, again, a few more words. One is incident and the other is reflected. Reflected is the easy one. It means the wave that has rebounded from an obstacle or a barrier, just like your reflection in a mirror is light that is bounced back to you. The incident wave is the wave that is coming into the object or a barrier. This little um, GIF down here, this should be uh, animated as well, but it's not. But it's from um, physicsclassroom.com. They have a lot of good uh, animations when it comes to waves. So a fixed boundary is in, uh, for example, when we take a rope and we tie it securely to a pole of some sort, and then we flick the one end of the rope, when it reaches the pole that we tied it to, it cannot move, so it is a fixed boundary. And when that happens, the wave is inverted, so it gets flipped over a hundred and we call that it's, uh, and we say that it's 180 degrees out of phase. And again, this little animation 
would be nice to see. So check out uh, Physics Classroom to see the animations. A free boundary is when we haven't tied the rope securely to the pole. The, the rope can still move up and down on the pole. It's attached to the pole, but it can move up and down on the pole. And in that case, the wave will stay the same. It won't be flipped over. So no matter, but no matter what kind of boundary we approach, the speed and the wavelength of the reflected waves are the same, so long as they've stayed in the same medium. And in high school, in this class, we are going to stay in the same medium for mechanical waves. In, in the practical world, the wavelength will spread out as the wave loses energy. So it looks like the wavelength changes past a boundary, but that's primarily because we're seeing it in a real medium which has things like friction and particle interactions which take away some of the energy of our wave. Interference is when two, is what happens when two waves interact with each other or meet each other. The shape of the resultant wave, so remember resultant is when we're adding things together in physics, is determined by the magnitudes of the amplitudes of each wave. Let's see if we have an example on the next slide. So here we have constructive interference. Constructive interference means that the waves build on top of each other. So you can see here we have a red wave and a blue wave. When they interact, they stack on top of each other so that what we observe is the green wave on top. So we would see this green wave here. The red wave and the blue wave do not interfere with e each other though. So anytime two waves interfere with each other, they change what we observe, but they do not change each other. They pass through each other on the other side. So after they keep going, Nothing has changed for those two waves, but while they are passing each other, they change how we observe those waves. Same thing if they have a negative amplitude. We have the red one, which has a negative amplitude, and a blue wave pulse, which also has a negative amplitude. So when they add together, they become more negative. And you can see that here in this picture. We can see that there is a ridge here of stronger waves, of higher waves, because there's two waves that are interacting with each other on this pond. Destructive interference is where two waves start to cancel each other out. But again, they will pass through each other as if nothing happened. The interference only changes what we are observing. So for example, we have a red wave pulse with a positive amplitude and a, a blue wave pulse with a negative amplitude, equal negative amplitude. So when they interfere with each other, we would see nothing. It would look like the waves had disappeared. However, on the other side, if they kept going, the blue wave pulse 
would come back and the red wave pulse would also come back. And they'd keep going at the same speed that they had before, the same wavelength that they had before, the same amplitude that they had before. And then what happens if we have two unequally sized waves interfere with each other? So in this case, we can say like this one has positive one amplitude and the blue one has negative two. It goes down twice as far. So our resultant wave would have an amplitude of negative one. But if they continue on, they would return to normal. They wouldn't bounce off of each other. They would keep going in the way that they were before. This video, I'll put, a, I'll put the link below. It shows slinkies interfering with each other. You have to watch really carefully in order to see some of the interference happening because he, the, the students are not entirely perfect in getting the slinky pulses going, but that's okay. So the principle of superposition is essentially what I was saying in the other two slides. When two waves interfere, the resulting displacement of the mediums at the, any location is the sum of the displacements of the individual waves at that same location. So that's important. So if we have two waves in the same, that have the same amplitude, we have to add up their amplitudes at each location. So for example, we have here, they both have an amplitude of two and a half. So we add that much to them again. So it becomes twice as high. At this point here, this one has an amplitude of about one. This wave has an amplitude of about three. So we add those together and there would be an amplitude of about four from this equilibrium position. Same thing on the bottom. So if we take a point here, Let's see, where's a good spot? No, we can do it here. If we take this wave, which has an amplitude of one about there, and this one, which has an amplitude quite significantly less, we would have to subtract, because they're in opposite, uh, op they have opposite displacements, and the results would be the line in the middle. So the yellow line on these graphs is what we would actually observe, but the green waves and the blue waves don't change energy, they don't change amplitude, they don't change wavelength, they don't change speed, they just keep going. In phase and out of phase, in phase means that the crests and trough, troughs line up with each, each other. Out of phase means the crests and troughs do not line up with each other. So do they, are they synced or are they not synced? Standing waves are something that we will talk about more on um, in another video. Standing waves are what happens when two waves of the same frequency, wavelength, and amplitude travel in opposite directions and interfere with each other.
dawn of a fatal day, and the wind begins to speak with a roar that no man can fail to hear. In a 40-mile-an-hour gale, the center span weaves like a ribbon in a swinging twist that you wouldn't believe possible unless you could see it as you do now. There's an automobile caught on the heaving roadway. The 11,000-ton center span twists and strings the giant cables that support it. Cables of 6,300 wire strands, each 17 inches thick. Back out of the danger zone, all stricken spectators are driven to safety as the bridge gyrates like a nightmare high above the river, twisting, turning, curling. The lone motorist is forced to abandon the car. He has but a few minutes in which to save himself. Face to face with fate, his destiny hanging in the balance. Will he heed the last warning or perish with the doomed structure? But he saves himself by seconds. No structure of steel and concrete can stand such a strain. Steel girders buckle and giant cables snap like puny threads. There it goes! divided as to the cause of the disaster. Some claim it was the use of solid girders, others differ. But whatever the reason, Tacoma will rebuild, this time a bridge that will not provide a super thrill in the news.